Thank, thanks, Anne-Marie. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me back. I can't believe it's a year since I was last here. I mean, it only seems like yesterday, but what a, what a year it's been, um, politically. Um, I suppose reflecting back, if one would think about the assembly election, of course, in, in May this year, and then Brexit, uh, and now Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> so it only gets better, really. Um, uh, so it's been quite a, a profound set of uh, changes. What I'm going to start with, I think, just to refresh all our memories, I suppose, including mine, um, is the election um, back, in, back in May. Um, there was a lot of anticipation about, sorry, there was a lot of anticipation about the election and whether or not, um, particularly perhaps the TV, would make some inroads into the DV vote. But as things turned out, uh, in terms of relative party strengths, they remain the same as they were beforehand. Um, what was interesting is that all of the, the, the votes for all of the parties who had been in the executive, including Alliance, fell uh, at the election, um, including the DUP's vote, which went down marginally, I think by, what was it, 0.7 or 8%, I think, something like that. Um, UP's vote slipped um, and there was some hope of course um, part of Mike Nesbitt that following the relative success that UP achieved at the general election the year before and the very marginal increase they got in their vote at the local elections as well that there would be some advance for the UP and I don't know if you remember but uh, Mike Nesbitt said he had written down on a piece of card somewhere that uh, he'd address a letter to himself that predicting how many seats they would win. Now, he was very modest because when the letter or the envelope was opened, I think he'd put down 18 or 19. Uh, what they ended up with, of course, was the same number of seats that they got at uh, the previous Assembly election in 2011 by recouping back or regaining the three seats they'd lost through the defections of... Um, McAllister, McRae and McNary, but that was it. Um, in fact, for both the UUP and the SDLP, it was the weakest vote that both those parties had in terms of vote share at any election. Um, uh, so, hardly a resounding success. I think Mike Nesbitt actually said about the UUP's performance that it couldn't be described as a success. Well, actually, it was a failure in terms of their vote share across Northern Ireland as a whole. It was their lowest. And the same is true of the SDLP. And it is quite remarkable when you think back to the very first post-agreement election, <coughs> when the SDLP topped the poll and the EUP came, came second in terms of first preference votes. Uh, and now, in each case, their votes have virtually halved uh, over that period. Uh, and certainly the SDLP seats have, have more than halved since those halcyon days of uh, 1998 um, and ditto the UUP. So what we've seen as far as those two parties are concerned is serial decline over the period. And one of the other things that's worth just reminding you of the context is that again, although it was marginally down, the turnout fell in 2016 as well. Um, and ever since that first election in 1998, electoral turnout in Northern Ireland has fallen at every assembly election. So there is a trend. Uh, there's a trend that affects both the EUP and the SDLP. Uh, and there's a trend to, in terms of, I suppose, of what you might characterise as disengagement by the wider electorate. Um, uh, even though the contest itself was very hotly contested. And of course the DUP played, and maybe this took some people by surprise, it didn't take me by surprise, but the DUP played the, the card again of, if it didn't, as it were, emerge as the largest single party, shock horror, sky will fall in, chicken licking, um, Martin McGuinness will be first minister. Um, and that card was very prominently played, as it has been before in previous elections by, by the DUP. Overall, for the Unionists, they've got a majority of the seats um, in the chamber, 
56 if you count in uh, Jim Allister and of course Claire Sugden, although she ran as an independent, as we all know, she was co-opted in to replace uh, David McClarty and she is in effect a unionist, so push comes to shove, I mean she'll be on that side of, as it were, the House. The SDLP's vote fell much more than was the case of the DUP and the UUP, but the real surprise perhaps was the, the fall in Sinn Féin's vote um, by almost 3%. Uh, now, that was a very weak performance by them uh, in their terms, uh, but more interestingly perhaps is that the outcome was that together Sinn Féin and the SDLP secured just 40 seats. That's the lowest number of nationalist seats in the Assembly since 1998. Okay. Um, it's also the fourth consecutive election where the combined nationalist vote has fallen, as has the combined vote share. So, yes, it was irritating for the DUP. They lost, I think it was about just under 1% of their total first preference vote. Uh, UUP fell as well by about the same sort of uh, uh, margin, I think it was 0.7%, but a combined fall with the SLP in Sinn Féin of over 5%, uh, and, th and that's quite a significant fall. Now in part, of course, that's explained by them being outflanked on the left in both West Belfast and Foreign by people before profit. Um, uh, w which returned uh, uh, two candidates, as you know, Emma McCann and Jeremy <coughs> Carroll. Um, Alliance, no change, it hung on to its eight seats, um, although its vote fell as well. Um, Greens picked up a seat in South Belfast, uh, perhaps no surprise that they picked up a seat there. They were hoping for at least one more, um, uh, according to Stephen Avenue, maybe four even, but they picked up one. People for profit, of course, a net gain of two because they had no one there before. But there was no shredding of the unionist vote at this election. There was some anxiety that there may be some fragmentation of the vote, given you know the fact that there were so many unionist parties contesting the election. Uh, not just the DUP and the UUP, but of course we had the PUP, which got absolutely nowhere. Uh, the Conservatives ran, and it was an utterly dismal performance for them, and it wasn't very much better for UKIP either. So the, any anxiety that there'd been amongst unionist political leaders that they would be damaged by the advent of other unionist parties and by their performance were not realised. Okay. So the changes that took place actually were on the margins of uh, of uh, the wider uh, state of party competition in Northern Ireland. But it is, I think, noteworthy that the nationalist vote share fell. Uh, and it seems to be falling. I think we can now relatively safely talk about a downward trend in the nationalist share of the vote in Northern Ireland. Um, with the unionist vote more or less remaining buoyant but to put this in perspective, the combined first preference vote of the SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party was only about 10,000 ahead of the votes, first preference vote for Sinn Féin. So we are seeing, as it were, the two minor of the major parties, their levels of support falling too, uh, particularly the SDLP, which only returned with 12 seats, lost two, and only just qualified for, in theory, one seat around the executive table, like the LC Unionists. Okay? It's very difficult to say about the SDLP that they are in anything other than significant long-term decline. Okay? Um, the LC Unionist Party kind of held its own, although its vote share fell. But it, it, any talk of it, as it were, staging a comeback um, is much too, it's much too early to tell. It's a bit like a Ho Chi Minh, you know, when he was asked about what do you think of Western civilization, and he said, well, it's too early to tell. It's certainly too early to tell whether uh, the LCU units are going to, in any sense, dent support for um, uh, uh, their candidates. 
turnout in unionist con constituencies rose, uh, and in nationalist constituencies it fell. Now the fact that it rose in unionist constituencies doesn't necessarily mean that the combined votes for unionist candidates increased, okay? but turnouts tended to be, as it were, have an effect in unionist constituencies. More people voted, a greater share of electors voted in unionist constituencies than in nationalist constituencies. Um, and as I say, the nationalist combined vote fell for the fourth successive assembly election, or the fourth, fourth successive election, actually. Uh, if you go back over uh, the prior assembly election, local, uh, uh, or local government elections, European elections, and the Westminster election, you know, it's down. And that does now look like a clear trend here. Okay? They were being elected, of course, to a newly configured administration. Um, as, you, as you're aware, the number of departments was reduced from 12 to, uh, to 9. Uh, and that was the product of all-party agreement on the need to reconfigure uh, the executive. Um, in addition to the number falling, uh, and I think this was perhaps equally important, uh, or noteworthy at least, is that the executive office, as it's now called, OFMDFM as was, had many of its functions stripped away from the centre and reallocated to this new generation of uh, government departments here in Northern Ireland. And I think that's important because until now, the executive office, and I've, I've probably said this before, and certainly a view that I held for, for ever since, 1998-9, is that the, the OFM, DFM was overloaded with functions. You know, it became like a department of government. The, rather than being akin to, say, the Cabinet Office in London, which is a kind of strategic hub of government at the centre, it, become, it became overburdened, I think. Uh, uh, and that's why, of course, it has such a very large staff. And the fact that it had something like 24 departmental functions to discharge meant that the opportunity space and time it had to engage in strategic thinking, strategic policy thinking about Northern Ireland was pressured as a consequence of the day and daily grind of being a department actually delivering services and functions uh, across Northern Ireland. So I think that change, the hollowing out of OFM, DFM is actually a positive step uh, because it gives the incumbents in the executive office more space and more time to engage in strategic thinking. And that's if they've got strategic bones in their bodies, as it were, but nevertheless, the, the opportunity is there now and the space and the time for them to be more, if you like, blue sky thinking about policy options for the future. As things turned out, we've got five DUP ministers and four Sinn Féin ministers, plus Claire Sugden, and we all remember the kerfuffle there was about trying to find a justice minister, and who was it going to be, and you know, would it be Alliance again, would it be somebody else? The one person it couldn't be, of course, was Jim Allister, who's probably the most legally qualified person in the chamber, but nevertheless, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, he wasn't going to be uh, a candidate that would secure support from the other parties. So we ended up with Claire, a uh, former student of mine, very industrious uh, 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 when she was uh, 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 at Queen's uh, and hardworking. Um, but nevertheless, it came as a real surprise. And it was, of course, a decision that was taken to get the DUP and Sinn Féin off the hook. And I suppose if you want to draw anything from that decision to give the job, in effect, to Claire, was that it is still the case that the DUP doesn't trust the prospect of a Sinn Féin minister taking up the justice portfolio, nor does Sinn Féin trust the idea of a DUP minister taking up the justice portfolio. And I suppose in that respect, you can say that that process exemplifies still the lurking mistrust and suspicion that there is between those two parties. Um, uh, over this particular uh, department. And I suppose if it ever comes to the point where we get either a Sinn Féin or a DUP minister uh, taking over justice, then that would be a signal that maybe our political system is maturing uh, 
to the point where there is a sufficient level of trust to enable one or the other to take on that particular portfolio. The big question hanging over it because of John McAllister's bill, which was much diluted during its uh, progress through uh, uh, the chamber, through the assembly, was the provision for an official opposition. Now, <clears throat> this is something that had been long fought for by many people uh, in the assembly and by many outside as well, and something I've certainly argued for for, for some years. Um, and as things turned out, both the UUP and the SDLP uh, opted for opposition. One of the ironies, I suppose, of the situation was that although alliance was being clearly um, discussed actively as taking on again the Justice Ministry, um, even though they only got eight seats they were, as, a, as a kind of uh, compromise, um, so they could have got into the executive had they so chosen, but because they only got eight seats, they didn't qualify for an official opposition role within the chamber. So we have this peculiar situation where they could have been in government, but they can't. They don't qualify because they, have, they have, don't have sufficient seats to be a member of the official opposition. Okay. So they're, yes, an oppositional small old party, but they needed at least one more seat, I think, or two perhaps, to actually qualify <coughs> to become... Uh, one of the official opposition parties. Now, <coughs> what the legislation does that created uh, uh, official opposition was a number of things, I'll come on to those. But the big question, I suppose, then was, well, will this change the dynamics of um, uh, our government system, our political system, if we have an official opposition? I mean, many people have argued for a long time that you can't really talk about a democracy if you haven't got an, a formal opposition in place ready to take on those who are actually in executive positions. No opposition, no democracy. It was a phrase that was coined by an American uh, constitutional lawyer called Lawrence Lowell, um, which many people have quoted over the, the past decade or so, to just qualify the character uh, of our democratic system, which, as you know, is a very contrived one. It's consociational. There are all sorts of checks and balances built into the system. Uh, and it's worth noting that it's not unusual for consociational governments or consociational parliaments or po political systems modelled on consociational principles not to have an opposition. Okay. Um, Switzerland, which is a classic consociation, is an oppositionless democracy. Okay. We were an oppositionless democracy, in effect. Um, now, one party in Switzerland did for a period earlier this decade uh, to go into opposition, one of the parties that was eligible for membership of the Federal Council, as the governing body is called in Switzerland, uh, did go into opposition for a, for a period of a few months, didn't like it, and went back into the administration again. So we weren't unique in the sense of being the only consociational system that didn't have an official opposition. Okay. It wasn't that it's not it's not the norm for consociations to have official oppositions in the sense that we now we now have one. So there was this um, anticipation that this would change the character and change the dynamic of proceedings certainly within within the chamber. Now the, I think in some part that's based on some misconceptions about the role of an opposition in a consociational system. And I think that there were perhaps false expectations about the role that an opposition could perform within our context. One of the key questions, I'll come back to this in a minute, was whether in fact the parties who qualified uh, for opposition would be cohesive, would they be coherent? Well, you tell me a parliamentary system where opposition parties are, by preference, cohesive and united, um, rather than, as it were, competitive. Okay. It's not the case. So this idea that somehow the SCLP and the UUP would form a phalanx of unity within the chamber, I think was misplaced. That was never going to happen. Okay. <coughs> 
Now, many people will be disappointed by that outcome. It isn't going to happen. Um, uh, even though, as you know, the legislation provides for a leader of the opposition and a deputy leader of the opposition. And the incumbents of those two roles is, uh, is governed by the relative seat strength of the, uh, the relevant parties. Um, Mike Nesbitt, I think, is styling himself as uh, leader of the opposition, but um, uh, uh, although he's not particularly uh, bothered, I think, by the status that confers, uh, in, in a formal sense anyway, um, and uh, 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 Colm Eastwood certainly hasn't embraced the role of deputy leader, formally as deputy leader of the opposition. So I think this sense, before it happened, that somehow these two, new par- these two parties will come together in this new dispensation and create this cohesive uh, block to oppose the DUP in Sinn Féin and Claire Sugden, for that matter, as and when necessary, I think was illusive. Yeah. I don't think that was going to happen, and I don't think it will happen in the sense of there being a strong strategic block of opposition parties in, in the chamber. The Assembly isn't, in that sense, Westminster in miniature, as it were. In Westminster, and there have been many references to, you know, the Westminster model, as it were, of somehow providing a template for, for the Assembly. That's misguided, I think, because, of course, in the context of Westminster, the role of the leader of the opposition actually was put into statute in Westminster in 1937, and the understanding there, of course, in the convention and the practice, is that the opposition forms a government in waiting. Yeah, that it is an alternative to the current administration, whatever that administration might be. Now, that rule normally applies in the case of Westminster, but as you know, the Labour Party is in complete and utter internal disarray. The Civil War hasn't gone away, you know. Um, uh, and Corbyn has still got more than 40 places to fill, uh, junior opposition posts, uh, in the chamber, and it's very doubtful that he would be in a position to do that. Um, so we have a defeated opposition in terms of personnel currently in Westminster, um, uh, and uh, a party that is clearly at sixes and sevens with itself. Um, I mean, one thing that struck me most about the Conservative Party conference last week was how little the Labour Party in general, and Jeremy Corbyn in particular, had to say about what was going on at the Conservative Party conference, in particular in relation to Theresa May's speech on Sunday, where she made it abundantly clear, and this was reinforced by her speech on the following Wednesday, that we're in for a hard Brexit. I'll come on to Brexit in a bit. But in our model, which, as you know, is designed to promote inclusive power sharing, the EUP and the SDLP are not, in the Westminster sense, a government in waiting. They're not. Uh, If the electoral fortunes of the DUP and the SDLP falter uh, at the next assembly election or succeeding election, um, it doesn't mean that they're going to be entirely displaced uh, by the EUP and the SDLP. In fact, in the electoral data suggests that that is not going to be the case for obvious reasons because of the significant uh, uh, serial decline in support for those two two parties. Nor, indeed, are either the DUP or Sinn Féin going, as it were, to relinquish their claim on executive seats around the table. So the dynamic is not the Westminster dynamic of the parties, as it were, the European SDLP posing as an alternative government, they're posing, if you like, as critical possible partners in a future administration that will also include the DUP and Sinn Féin and maybe Alliance, who knows? Uh, but that hinges on electoral fortune. So Westminster is not the model to follow here. This is quite a unique situation um, and one which we're going to have to watch 
unfurled. Now, um, the role of an opposition, of course, is to scrutinize uh, the executive of the day to render it accountable both within the chamber and indeed in committee rooms and to come up with alternative policies to those which are being as it were promoted by the governing parties um, it means of course among other things that they have to come up with an agreed program but I there isn't in my judgment going to be a strategic coalition between the UP and the SDLP in discharging their interpretation of the role of an opposition party in the chamber. I think what is much more likely is that what we'll experience are shifting tactical coalitions, issue by issue. Okay. Now, some of those issues will be on a macro basis. It, obviously, and I suppose one of the major ones is going to be the new programme for government, um, and the next budget round, which is only going to... We were, of course, planning to have multi-year budgets here in Northern Ireland, but because of um, particularly the uncertainties accentuated by Brexit, uh, we're now only getting a budget for the next year ahead, as it were, the next financial year, because of all the uncertainties that are being created by our impending exit from the European Union. Now, they have some tools, the opposition parties, as a consequence of the legislation. Um, they get 10 opposition days, and they used the first one last week, some people say that they misused their, their supply day, as it's called in the Westminster context, their opposition day, by addressing two issues for which the devolved executive has no authority. Um, and I think that probably was a mistake. Um, but that might be the product of a failure of the UP and the SDLP to agree, at that stage at least, a common approach and common, a common agenda uh, for that particular day's business. Anyway, they've got them. They can decide what they want to bring to the chamber for debate, just like uh, the non-executive parties in Scotland do, and indeed in Wales. Um, I think from memory, actually, the 10 days that, that the UP and the SDLP will enjoy is actually rather more than the non-executive parties get in the Scottish Parliament. From memory, I think they get 16 half days over the course of a, session, of, uh, of a, a parliamentary year. Um, but they so they got rather more. Initially, it was to be 15. Um, that was kind of the, the, the number that was being batted around and there seemed to be agreement on, but that was then subsequently reduced to 10. The leader of the opposition gets to chair the Public Accounts Committee and the deputy leader, uh, the, the deputy chair of the committee, um, or n nominees of either, uh, not necessarily Messrs. Uh, 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 Nesbitt and Eastwood <coughs> and they lead on assembly questions to the executive office so you know they have as it were speaking rights uh, in the chamber which are true as a consequence of them taking up the role of official opposition so there are tools there uh, that they can deploy um, and of course they've got to come up with a kind of uh, uh, an agreed means of employing those tools to scrutinise, hold the uh, executive to account, and, and so on, and to detect and exploit policy differences where they can, uh, particularly between the DUP and Sinn Féin. But in order to do that, among other things, they need access to official information, and we saw a debate last week on accountability and openness in the chamber, which addressed this very matter. And it was quite telling during the course of the debate, um, no member, no minister participated or even appeared in the chamber until the very last gasp when Peter Weir turned up for a couple of minutes, I think, at the tail end of the debate. Um, now, this is important. Um, what had prompted it, among other things, of course, was the leak of the, no, we're now told by the Permanent Secretary in EO, of a partially completed assessment of the implications for Northern Ireland of the Brexit vote. Okay. And uh, Stephen McCaffrey of the detail managed to get hold of that report by means of a freedom of information request. Okay. Now, we are in, meant to be in an FOI era, as it were. The importance of freedom of information is that it means that we as citizens um, have a right to know what 
the government of the day is doing, whether it's in the UK-wide context or whether it's in a more parochial Northern Ireland context. That, that is to say that the onus on government is to disclose information. Okay. Or come up with a public interest defence of why it shouldn't be released. So there are means by which government can defend its position to not release official information. But it looks superficially as though what the DUP and Sinn Féin are operating is the old regime, which was a regime of what was styled as open government. Now the problem with open government is that the government of the day decides what to publish, when to publish it, and in what form it will publish. That is to say, Nanny knows best. Now, we are meant to be in a situation where we have a right to know. And I think what <coughs> it looks like is that the DUP and Sinn Féin are cleaving to this now outmoded view of open government. Uh, <coughs> the access to official information in whatever form it is, is critical for opposition parties to use the tools that they have at their disposal uh, in order to make an effective case for whatever issue or issues they might want to advance, as it were. Um, when a government is perceived as, as being, as it were, more secretive than it, you know, secrecy is a habitual vice of UK government in particular. Okay. <coughs> the Freedom of Information Regime does add another tool to the arsenal or the kit that, that political parties and, and ordinary citizens can, can deploy. Um, and I think in order to be effective, the EUP and the SLP have got to get much smarter about their use of FOI provisions. One of the difficulties is, which is encountered, though, is that the legislation provides that the department of which the request is targeted must reply within 20 working days to the initial request. Now that doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, in some cases, months pass before that information is disclosed. So I think they've got to, as it were, press that FOI button more often. They've got to be more targeted. They've got to use the resources at their disposal to try and affect more focused scrutiny in order to gain accountability uh, from uh, executive ministers. Uh, and to date, that hasn't been the case. But it's early days, you know, we'll give them a Bible for the time being. Um, and in part, um, it, it rests on the resources that the parties, the opposition parties, have at their disposal. Okay, now, in March this year, um, the Assembly Commission tabled a, a report uh, on the floor of the House um, that was uh, in part dedicated to the issue of what financial resources would be made available to the UP and the STLP or whichever parties chose to go into opposition, those two as it, as it turned out. But there was a ceiling of £60,000 placed on the total amount, and that amount was arrived at by top slicing the financial assistance of political part, the other political parties in the executive. Okay, so it wasn't new money; it was money that was top sliced out of the money that was already being allocated to Sinn Féin and the DUP in order to fund the opposition parties, because they need not just money; they need people uh, to actually do the research in order to more effectively discharge their roles. Now. I'm not clear in my own mind whether that 60,000 is distributed equally between uh, the EUP and the SLP, and um, it's not. Gareth is shaking his head. Is it 40-20 or 35-25? I think on the basis of the number of members. Members, yeah. They, they, they you don't know how that falls out, Gareth? No. no. But it's 60,000 um, uh, for two researchers. Okay, one each. Um, that compared to, for example, the salaries and the number of special advisors which are uh, available to the SLP, uh, sorry, Sinn Féin and DUP. I mean, it just dwarfs 
the amount of things. Spas on average are paid six figures, 109,000 there or thereabouts. You know. Here's 60,000 being made available for the two opposition parties. So uh, Casey Weir, um, who's an English uh, political scientist, and uh, his particular specialism was parliamentary committees. And he said of parliamentary committees that they need to be well fed, i.e., well resourced, and well led, that they have to have, as it were, good chairs in order to, as it were, make the committees effective. Now, I would say that you could equally deploy that phrase, well fed and well led to opposition. Okay. Now, how well fed they should be is a matter for argument, I suppose. But it seems to me that a total of £60,000 top slice from an existing budget for the financial assistance to parties is relatively small beer. Okay. Um, and it may not be sufficient to enable the opposition parties to uh, discharge their roles as effectively as they, uh, as they might otherwise do. Now, that's not to say they aren't without other resources, because, of course, of this marvellous library here and the research uh, uh, raise uh, that service within the Assembly, which does an enormous amount of sterling work, and certainly I'm sure you're all aware of the publications they produce and how helpful they are, particularly for your, for your students. Um, but if you want the opposition to be as effective as it can be, then they do need not only the tools of supply days and, and all the rest of it, they actually need staff to enable them to be more coherent and more effective and more efficient in the way that they set about using those tools that they have. So whether it's information, whether it's money, whether it's people, there is a question about whether sufficient of all three has been made available to, to the party. So where are we now? Well, we have a whole raft, as you know, uh, neuralgic issues which <coughs> plague this place. Um, Stormont House Agreement, fresh start, made some advance on these issues and a variety of proposals to do with the parks and parading and flags and so on, and victims, none of which are fully resolved. Um, they're all, you know, uh, in progress, goodness knows. I gather the Spotlight tonight is doing a special on victims, uh, which is going to be quite um, a dramatic uh, uh, program, so there's another glitch uh, in the policy on victims, which apparently is, they're going to make clear tonight. So we've got those kind of long-standing issues that the parties here are going to have to try and contend with, but we've also got this new issue of Brexit. Now this is really important. You know, I'm still grieving over the result, right? Um, and I couldn't believe it, like many of you here perhaps, uh, when I woke up that morning, having managed to stay awake until 4 o'clock and I eventually fell, fell asleep on the settee. Um, this is going to structure our politics for the foreseeable future. You know, this is not just about triggering Article 50 before the end of March next year, all the two years, uh, which will be, de you know, that two-year period that then kicks in is about how we extricate ourselves from the European Union uh, and what kind of model do we want in terms of uh, relationship between our economy and uh, the economies in uh, the rest of the EU, whether we're in the single market or whether we're in the customs union and all the rest of it. This will go on for decades, at least a decade. Partly because, and it is a quite a smart move on the part of the UK government, you know, she's proposed to Theresa May the Great Reform Bill, um, which is going to, in parliamentary terms at Westminster, they call it grandfathering. This is where a body of law is brought together under one big umbrella, <coughs> so they're going to incorporate all the EU law that we currently have touches in one great big bill. And then the idea is that over time, an indefinite period, that bill is then addressed and all the provisions in it, including the 11,000 plus regulations that apply uh, in the UK, one by one they'll be sifted through and the government will decide, well, we'll keep that one, we might amend that one, we're going to jettison that one. Now this is going to be very greedy of time and it's going to be very greedy of personnel. Okay. So we don't know what this is going to look like, partly, of course, because we don't know 
what the government's precise negotiating position is going to be. Hence, the current controversy that's raging over in Westminster about what role Parliament has, the UK Parliament, in relation to the negotiating terms that the UK government is going to bring to the table once Article 50 is triggered. We don't know. The government is saying there will be no parliamentary vote on our negotiating terms. Now, it argues that it's got a popular mandate, i.e. popular sovereignty supersedes parliamentary sovereignty on this issue. We've got a mandate to negotiate the terms of exit. Parliament does not have a role. And in strict sense, Parliament does have a role because the referendum was, like all referendum, advisory. It wasn't binding. Okay. We also don't know yet, clearly, what the motives were that dictated how people voted on June the 23rd. They were mixed. We're not sure about the relative salience of the motives. We also know that the Scots and we voted to stay in. So we're not talking about a unified UK position. This is it exemplified, in fact, this idea of the UK as a union state rather than as a unitary state. Because the Scots and we voted differently, as did London. Okay? So the government, though, is saying the vote trumps everything. It trumps Parliament. I think that's really very risky and uh, highly problematic. We don't yet know, for instance, <coughs> how Parliament will be involved in this process. We know that there's going to be a select committee on Brexit to monitor David Davis's department, the Brexit department, the Brexit minister. Okay. What we don't know is how big it will be the chair will be elected by the House. Okay. And among others, Hillary Benn is in the running to take on the, the chair of that committee. But we don't know, for instance, whether it will be a large committee. The problem with the larger a committee becomes, the more difficult it is to manage. Specifically, in our case, where presumably there will be Scottish MPs and Northern Ireland MPs involved in that committee. With one exception, of course, because if that provision is made, and we don't know whether it will be, we don't know how the devolved administrations will be involved in this process. We simply don't know. Okay? It's not been made clear. But let's assume that they have a role on that committee. One party, which is avidly pro-Remain, of course, will not participate in that and that shouldn't be, because it doesn't take its seats at Westminster. Now, I think that's a problem. Okay. Now, clearly, Sinn Féin is going to exert as much leverage as it can on the Irish government, um, which is one reason why it's welcomed uh, uh, Enda Kenny's proposal for a consultative committee to meet on the 2nd of November. Uh, to discuss, uh, it defeats me why the DUP and the House Unionists are not participating in that. Um, the UK needs all the help it can get. We need all the help we can get in Northern Ireland because we are especially vulnerable to some of the you know, economic consequences of Brexit because of our heavy reliance on our position as being a net beneficiary of EU funding. Okay. But we don't know, A, whether Parliament will have a role as a whole, and we don't know whether and to what extent the devolved administrations will be involved in this process. You know? It's incredibly uncertain, and it really matters. It especially matters because we voted the way we did, and the Scots voted the way they did. You know? The 48% people who voted to remain seem to have, as it were, been regarded by the government as bit players in this process. That's nearly half of the electorate that turned out on the day, back in June. 
it is completely enigmatic and shrouded in mystery about how this process is going to unfold. And I'm particularly concerned about the role of our administration in this process. Theresa May said that we consulted and all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, there's a North South Ministerial Council and there's a British Irish Council and all the rest of it. Actually, I don't think that's sufficient. In fact, if I was a leader of one of the political parties here, I would be thinking actively about setting up an assembly Brexit committee to bring to the table the, the, the concerns, the agenda that each of the parties entertains over this particular issue. <coughs> yeah. Just like the Commons is going to have a Brexit committee, I think the Scottish Parliament's already started down this track. We seem to be very slow out of the blocks. Nicola Sturgeon has set up an advisory group in Scotland to advise her. Um, we've done nothing of the sort as yet. But we know now that the trigger is going to be pulled before the end of March. Makes sense, actually, because, of course, in 2019, June 2019, is the next European parliamentary election. It would be farcical if, as it were, we weren't out before those elections. It could drag on beyond uh, uh, June 2019. So from the UK government's perspective, it makes perfect sense to say it'll be two years from the end of March. But it might not be because of the complexity of these negotiations. Okay. As you know, under Article 50, if the other 27 agree, the talks can be extended for a further year. But I cannot anticipate a situation where we put candidates up to contest the European parliamentary elections when we've got one and a half feet through the door and we leave them. So I think this says something about Brexit, the whole Brexit issue, whether you're for or against, I think it raises really interesting questions about, well, what role does Parliament have in this process? What role do the devolved assemblies have in this process? Not least because when we do leave, a number of the powers which currently reside in Brussels will come back to London, and some of those powers may be further devolved to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So, which you know, confirms the proposition that devolution is a process, not an event. So it's likely that the Scots, the Welsh and us will actually find more powers coming to here as a consequence of Brexit. And not to provide a formal mechanism through which the devolved administrations can contribute to this process seems to be uh, unconstitutional. <laughs> It weakens the role of Parliament, I think, in this context. Yeah. And we know, you know it's like a Geoffrey Archer novel, you know, you could make this up, because we know that there is a pro remain majority in the House of Commons, even more so in the House of Lords, which is one of the reasons why the government is fighting shy of giving Parliament a role in this wider process. Anyway, for us, um, I suppose. Uh, um, one of the things I said, I wrote a piece for the Telegraph just after the referendum result, you know, when I was kind of tearing my hair out, as it were, and I thought, I've got to do something therapeutic here, uh, to cleanse myself, as it were, to purge myself. Um, and I wondered whether at the time, in this context, whether this is going to force the STL, uh, the Sinn Féin and the DUP even more closely together. But it's difficult to envisage that, isn't it? Because they take diametrically opposed positions on this very issue. So that has the capacity, as it were, to rupture that relation. It's very difficult to envisage how that chasm can be bridged between the two parties. And I'm sure Sinn Féin will do what it can to lobby at Westminster, but the fact that it won't be participating in the scrutinising process of Parliament, I think, actually weakens its arguments and weakens its case. Anyway, are we going to have a hard and soft border? Well, I'm sure you've seen over the last couple of days that um, the Irish government and the British government through James Brokenshire and, and uh, Charlie Flanagan have talked about hardening up the ports of entry into Ireland uh, in the south, which uh, in effect... <clears throat> what that means is, of course, the UK government, if that comes about, 
is ceding control. Do you remember doing that? We must seize control over our borders. When in fact what it's doing here is it's franchising out control of the borders to the Irish government with the assistance of the UK government because there are going to have to be more people to man the posts, person the posts, but they're pushing, as it were, the border to Rosslare, Cork, Dublin, wherever it might be, rather than, as it were, on the border between North and South. Let's assume that happens, okay? That does not deal with the problem of the free movement of goods, services and people across the Irish border. Okay. We will be out and the Republic will be in. There has to be control over the movement of goods and services in that context. Now this hinges on whether we remain in the single market or not. Some politicians in the Conservative Party want to remain in the single market, others do not want us to remain in. People like Michael Gove, Liam Fox. Uh, they don't really even want us in the Customs Union. Now if that happens, there is going to have to be control over the movement of goods and services across the Irish border. There has to be. Because one of the consequences is going to be the introduction, I think, of tariffs. But it's not just tariffs, it's regulations that govern goods and services. Okay. And they have to be administered as well. So this is um, its a nightmare. We're having to import, central government is having to import foreigners to, to, to um, create the staff within particularly David Davis's department. He said last week, I think at the Tory party conference, that they're only 80%, they've only got 80% of the staff they need to conduct the Brexit negotiations. And they're importing people from the United States, from Canada, from Australia, from New Zealand, to actually create a body of personnel who can deal with these matters. Now, how ironic is that? Um, anyway, one option which has been proposed for Northern Ireland, and I know it's very live, I know the two parties here in particular have been talking to the Irish government about this option, which is Greenland in reverse. Greenland left the European Union in, in 1983, I think it was. Um, Denmark remained in, of course, and Greenland is administered uh, by Denmark, part of Denmark. Um, but the idea of it being in reverse is we stay in, the rest of the UK leaves. Some kind of accession status is granted to Northern Ireland. Okay? So unlike Greenland, the smaller bit, if you like, which left, we stay in. Now, <coughs> I don't think that is, certainly as far as the current government is concerned, that is not an option. As Theresa May put it, we voted as the UK, we will leave as the UK. No concession, as it were, to the fact that the majority of Scots and the majority of the Northern Irish um, voted to remain. I don't see that as a flyer. I think that the border will be hard. How hard? I, I don't know. It's a bit like choosing a pencil, isn't it? HB soft or HB hard or whatever. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to tell now partly because we don't know what the government's position is, nor does our administration here in Northern Ireland. All island conversation, yes, I think that's a really good idea, because the UK is going to need all our allies it can get in, during the course of those negotiations. It needs Ireland on side, not least because, of course, it's in the Irish interest as well, that there is as soft as possible a landing. Okay. But whether the other 26 member states are going to say to the Irish, yeah, you can have a soft landing, and thereby create an incentive for other countries who are currently in the EU perhaps to actively consider leaving, um, is unlikely, I think. So, what's the role of the Northern Ireland office here? Well, because territorial secretaries of state, whether it's Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, they wear two hats. They're Westminster's voice in the relevant region or nation, so, you know, he speaks for the government in Northern Ireland, but the other hat that Brokenshire or any of his predecessors had is to speak for Northern Ireland at uh, the top table in London. Okay. Now that has got to be finessed over this particular issue, and there are real difficulties here. 
Um, I think Theresa Villas, by common consent, was regarded too often as being Westminster's voice in Northern Ireland rather than being Northern Ireland's voice in Westminster. Now, in this context, I think Broken Shire has got to, as it were, at least have a more balanced approach to how he discharges those two particular roles and the relationship between them. Um, does he just row in behind the Prime Minister, which I suspect he will, and say, well, this is a UK-wide matter? You know, he, he, was a, he was a Remainer, by the way. Um, uh, it's a UK matter, it's a matter of the UK government. Or, to what extent will he be enabled to argue the NI case at the centre. And I think that's really important. I think there's a lot of, there will be a lot of pressure on him to argue the Northern Ireland specific case. Now in all this uncertainty, it is a sea of uncertainty, it matters even more, I think, that the DUP and Sinn Féin at the centre hold together. Because I think the risks that would follow with them publicly falling out over Brexit, I think, are incalculable. Um, not, not. I don't mean in terms of you know the whole edifice of devolution collapsing, but I think in terms of the eco economic damage that might be wrought, because you create a, a condition of political instability and uncertainty in Northern Ireland if they do fall out. So I think the pressure on them to hold together is very strong. Equally, I think it's very strong for the opposition parties too. And let's remember that both uh, the alliance smaller opposition, and both the EUP and the SDLP, officially the party lines, were to remain. So I think there's particular onus on them too to, to focus on this issue of Brexit and try to ensure that the Northern Ireland Assembly as a whole, and the Northern Ireland Executive in particular, is united in articulating its case for Northern Ireland in this sea of political and economic uncertainty. I'll stop there. <laughs>